so much fun three days today. I'm sorry. I'm trying to just do a thing now. Um, so our gospel lesson today is found on page 796, and I would love for you to take it out as we look at this text together, because I think you have probably heard this story before, um, but I want to talk a little bit about context. And to do that, we need to see what's before this happens. So, our gospel is the feeding of the 5,000. And it starts in the 14th chapter of Matthew at the 13th verse. And it says this. Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there into a in a boat to a deserted place by himself. And when the crowd heard it, they followed him on foot from all of the towns. And when Jesus went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them and stirred their sick. So when they heard it, they went away to a deserted place. What did they hear? What's the story that's just before this? another feeding story, another big banquet, but this one is thrown by a rich ruler by the name of Herod. And Herod threw a big banquet, like you might imagine a rich ruler would do, full of tomfoolery and show recipe. And um, some things happened. Does anybody know what happened at that dinner? Yeah. John the Baptist was murdered a hundred points to Ebony. Good job. Uh, John the Baptist was murdered. Solomon danced, and John's head was brought in on a silver platter. Does anybody know how John and Jesus are connected? They're cousins. So Jesus hears about John the Baptist's death, and he goes and grief. He tries to go off by himself to a deserted place. But he wasn't the only person that was grieving the loss of John the Baptist. All of these other people that had been following John suddenly were grieving too. And so they went out and they found Jesus. And Jesus met them exactly where they were, in their hurt, in their grief, in their fear. And Jesus had compassion. He spent time with them. He healed their sick. All day, they just come out together. Have you ever been to a funeral with a really good funeral? where there's time to sit and talk and tell stories and share laughter and remember the good things, their favorite jokes, that time when Uncle Lenny, all of that stuff. That's what they did. Only there was a problem. They weren't here at Grace, and they didn't have the funeral lunch team coming to prepare their meal. There was no food. There wasn't enough resources. How many of you have felt that anxiety when there are a ton of people around and you don't think there's enough food? I feel this all the time, but there are way too much. They had that anxiety with the disciples. It comes to the evening and they're in this deserted place. And instead of trusting that it's a new thing, this new way of being community together that they're learning from this guy that they're following around in the world of Jesus, Jesus, they go back to what they've known. Everybody fend for yourself. <laughs> We're on our own here. <laughs> you go home and figure it out. I can't help you. 
I don't have an answer. Sounds familiar? What the world tells us every day, right? Every man for themselves. No one's going to help you. Pull up your bootstraps and just get it done. Jesus says, no, don't do that. You're missing the point. That's not what this is about. My kingdom is about something different. We will give them something to eat. And the disciples say, but we only have five loaves and two fish, and that's not even enough for us. Scarcity thinking. The problem is too big for the resources that we have. Verse 18. Jesus said, Bring the little that you have. He ordered the crowd to sit down, and taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves, and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowd, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men, besides women and children. Um, 5,000 plus women and children, 10,000 people, five loaves, two fish. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't believe in magic. I really don't think Jesus did some kind of Pocus, pocus, light of hand trick, and pulled more fish and more loaves out of the rope and cast them. I don't know how this miracle happened. Look at the text. Tell me how it happened. Is it there? It's not there. We don't know. We don't know how it happened. I don't know if somehow, miraculously, with the power of God, when that bread was broken, it was like the oil in the lamp, and suddenly there was just more and more and more, and every time they broke it off, there was more. I don't know. I don't know if suddenly people felt their heart stir within them, and they pulled out that bag of pretzels that they stashed for the middle of the night in the famine when they knew they were going to be hungry and shared it with their friends. I don't know what the miracle was in the world. But I do know that God's abundance was enough to provide for each and every person that was sad and hurting and sick and gathered together there because they needed to. God love and care and abundance was more than enough to satisfy the needs of the people who were gathered there that day. So that there were baskets and baskets left over. There is enough food and resources on this earth that no one has to be hungry. God's kingdom is different. The dinner that Jesus served out in the wilderness is different. Everybody knew there was enough for all. It's different than the way our minds are trained to work. It's so easy for us to fall back into scarcity thinking and that there's not enough, and to doubt the power and promise of God. Even the disciples, the ones that were closest to Jesus, 
after this big meal, this miracle, Jesus tells the disciples to get in the boat and go. The crowd, he dismisses. And he goes to take that moment by himself and pray. And the disciples out on the water, all of a sudden, are battered by waves and wind in the midst of the storm and tears again. And Jesus comes walking to them on the water, something only God does. Three or four times in Scripture it's mentioned that God walks on the water, but it's only God. And so when the disciples see someone walking on the water, they freak out. Can you imagine being in a boat and someone just still and walking on the water with you? They freak out. They're terrified. Storm, wind, water washing over the side of the boat, and here comes someone to see it. And Jesus said, Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And then, in our text, it says, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. In the Greek, it says, I am, which is the name of God. They don't say that. They don't call on God's name. Lightning to strike. And Jesus comes to them on the water and says, do not be afraid. God is here. I am. I am with you. Peter, being Peter, wants to test this out and try it out for himself. He says, hey, can I, can I do that? <laughs> sure. Come on out. <laughs> and Peter does great for a minute, right? Feels very familiar to me. I go to church, feeling good in the moment and in the spirit. Then I go outside and I'm like, oh, real world. And I see the wind and the fear comes and pulls my focus. Just like Peter. Just like Peter. Immediately, the of the hand reaches out. He yanks him dripping wet out of the water. And says, why did you die? They got into the boat and they all went up. The wind came. The disciples came to the wind. They said, Of course, you're right. Yes, with everything that was happening, how could we not? Sometimes I think in the midst of these big, overwhelming, worldwide, global, systemic kind of problems like world hunger, we get caught up in the major resources that we have in this world. There's no way that I can buy a little $400 food budget is going to make a difference in this situation. And why can't These stories in our gospel from Matthew and to me tell us of God's power to change our minds and our hearts to focus on something different than we're trained to focus on. God's power and God's presence in our lives are not make a difference in how we see the world and how we interact with one another. And that by pulling our meager resources together, we can do something bigger than we would be able to do. 
And with that power of us together, we can make a difference in this world, in this here and now. And I have no idea how God makes that miracle happen. But I know that God's abundance is already here. There is enough. The question is, how do we think how we engage our resources, right? How do we interact with each other so that every mouth gets fed? God's power and God's presence is here with us. In the midst of whatever storms are going on around you, God is with you. God shows up and says, I love you. I care about you. And calls us out something bigger and something greater. In the name of this new community that God is trying to fix. I welcome these two uh, people who are joining us in this journey, in this community of faith, as we go about this work together. Let's pray. God be with us. If we struggle to understand how your person works in this world, we struggle to understand the how you meet us. God, show us your presence. Reach out your hand and pull us out on the right one. Wrap us in your arms. Show us the abundance that you have for us. Help us to find new ways to be together as community so that we can kind of work on some of these big problems so that we don't feel numb by fear or the inability to do anything. Oh, God. Give us hope. Give us faith. Help us to trust Yes, I'm going to get to the end of your sentence.